So with no further ado, let's jump into our program. Next slide, George. So real quick recap of our agenda. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of Current and then our partner, Evan Kriakos from Chicago Next will share a little bit about uh, what's coming up on their agenda. Svetlana Taylor will give us an overview of the Nutrient issue, and then we'll hear from our three startup partners, Brent Register, Dr. Owen Murray, and Dr. Luca Sanfilippo. And we are covering uh, a wide geographical territory today, um, from the, here in the Midwest all the way over to Rome. Really grateful to Luca for dialing in in his evening. Um, and then we'll do Q&A and discussion if we have time left, and then closing. So next slide, please. Great. So Current is Chicago's water innovation hub, and our mission is to grow the blue economy here in Chicago and Illinois by building solutions that solve the world's persistent water challenges, like the problem of nutrient contamination. We were founded in 2016 as a nonprofit partner uh, of the City of Chicago's Department of Water Management, MWRD, World Business Chicago, and we've grown into a collaboration of many university, public sector utility, startup, and corporate partnerships. We work by cultivating this ecosystem of cross-sector leaders and helping to accelerate the development and deployment of innovative water technologies like the ones you'll hear about today. Next slide. Great. This is how we track our impact. We're looking at the money, the funding and resources we're bringing to the startups in this sector, water technologies that we're helping to commercialize, the number of network connections we're making, and technologies we're evaluating in a database that helps us understand what's new, what's interesting, what's coming down the pipe. We also have pilot projects that we work on that are addressing specific water challenges like real-time water quality monitoring in the Chicago River. Um, we can share more about that, but pilots are ways that we go deep to bring technology into the real world to solve problems. Next slide. Great, this is just a list of our growing roster of industry and research partners. And we're really excited to have just rolled out a new way of working with startup partners and wanted to extend a welcome to our two newest startups, Storm Sensor and Cyclopure, both of them really addressing critical issues from stormwater management to um, the uh, addressing of PFAS issues, which is really a, a critical one. So Cyclopure has been a, a wonderful partner to us and Storm Sensor too. Thanks, George. A couple of ways that we help to provide actual concrete tools to our research partners and our tech partners. We have a water technology database that I mentioned where we're cataloging and constantly scanning all the innovative water technologies that solve challenges we're looking for. So this is a lot of how we identify the startups that we feature in these innovation showcases, but it's also a way that we share information about those companies with potential investors, with corporations that might want to work with them, it's part of this ecosystem building work that we do. So the water tech database is something that's available to current partners. Our research SharePoint site is a new offering as well. That's for our research community. We are working with a very exciting new Chicago startup called Halo to actually build a platform to help companies find and identify emerging technologies that solve their particular water challenges. So Halo is wonderful because they let you actually put an RFP on the platform and connect with a vast open innovation community of researchers with deep expertise in the areas that you care about. So Current has partnered with Halo to make Halo's RFP platform one of the offerings that we have for our corporate partners. So if you're interested in this opportunity, please drop me a note after the presentation today. We're really excited about this Halo partnership opportunity. And finally, our biggest new announcement uh, that just dropped yesterday, Chicago's first week of water, Chicago Water Week, is going to be happening September 28th through October 2nd. So this is five days of virtual events all around the topic of water leadership from a very large range and growing range of, of startups, of uh, our civic partners, foundation partners, um, utility partners. So this is really a wonderful chance to celebrate the wide and diverse array of water leaders here in the city of Chicago. We're super excited about this. Uh, if you wanna get in touch as a sponsor or a program partner, there's still opportunities for both of those. So get in touch after and this QR code will take you straight to the registration page. Great. All right. So. Very excited to have been partnering since day one on these innovator showcases with Chicago Next, an initiative of World Business Chicago. So love to turn it over to Evan to tell us what's the latest on Chicago Next agenda. Thank you, Lena. And a, spe a very special thank you to uh, Current for this incredible opportunity to support the Innovator Showcase Series, uh, which has been a really valuable event in our local tech ecosystem. 
and highlighting you know, entrepreneurs and innovators and the great work of current here in Chicago. Um, again, my name is Evan Kuriakos, Director of Chicago Next at World Business Chicago. WBC is the city of Chicago's economic development organization chaired by the mayor. And Chicago Next is WBC's dedicated initiative in driving inclusive growth and opportunity for Chicago's tech economy and innovation ecosystem. So we work very closely with the mayor's office uh, on a portfolio of programs to drive uh, opportunity and growth for our local tech companies or startups, entrepreneurs, innovators, and, and many other relevant stakeholders in our innovation ecosystem. Um, you know, we're, we're proud to say that Chicago leads as a global city for technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We're one of the largest and fastest growing VC ecosystems, uh, a large concentration of Fortune 500, so we're really invested in our local tech startup um, uh, and our local startups in our, in our tech ecosystem. Um, produce our universities being a significant producers of STEM talent and a wide variety of initiatives that are focused on building a more inclusive tech community. The two priorities I want to communicate here from the Chicago Next perspective is our Think Chicago program. And so uh, what we've noticed during COVID is on-campus recruitment has been severely challenged. And so we've led a series of partnerships with the University of Illinois system and the Chicago Mayor's Office to connect university students with innovative opportunities, career opportunities with our local companies. So if you're a local company that's hiring university talent in Chicago, please feel free to contact me. Uh, we have a, a wide variety of pathways and partnerships um, with local universities on future programming, especially with the fall semester just starting. The second thing I want to highlight is Chicago Venture Summit. Um, that was supposed to be hosted in 2020, but um, we've had to postpone to 2021. Um, and so that's where we showcase local Chicago startups with VC firms from across the country. Uh, this year, uh, specifically this fall, we're looking into launching a new startup growth program, a new initiative focused on venture matchmaking for local entrepreneurs and active investors from across the country. That announcement pending, but we're working on it right now. So if, if, if you're a startup that's getting ready for your next round of funding or an investor that wants to have a better uh, kind of view of Chicago's ecosystem, please feel free to connect, connect with Chicago Next. We'll be happy to share more details about these programs. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Evan, and really thank you so much for all that Chicago Next has done to build this growing startup community here in Chicago. We love partnering with you and can't wait to get the word out about these initiatives and more. So now it's time to turn it over to Svetlana Taylor, uh, current technical program director, who's gonna give us a really high level overview of the nutrient issue. Svetlana? Thanks, Elena. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'll give you a very, very quick background on the issue and also the technologies you'll hear about today. Uh, so why do we care about nutrient pollution? Uh, because we have a huge environmental economic problem created by nutrients, the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia zone. It is the largest dead zone in the US and the second largest in the world. Excess nutrients brought to the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River each spring cause massive algae blooms, and subsequent algae decomposition process consumes all oxygen, creating a dead zone where few animals can survive. The size of this zone fluctuates every year, but the five-year average has been way above the target size, as you can see on this plot. Illinois is one of the largest contributors of nutrients to the Mississippi River Basin, and naturally, we should care about solving this issue. Next, please. The sources of nutrients are commonly divided into point and non-point sources. Yeah. Next, please, George. The point sources are the water resource recovery facilities and non-point sources are agricultural and urban runoff. In Illinois, roughly 80% of nitrogen pollution is attributed to agricultural runoff, whereas total phosphorus load was split about 50-50 up until a few years ago, and now it is less for point sources. Next, please. The approaches to reducing nutrient pollution are strikingly different for the two cases. In point sources, the amount of nutrients exiting the facilities is monitored, and the effectiveness of the processes and technologies can be controlled, thus the regulatory approach. On the other hand, nutrient loss reduction from non-point sources, which relies largely on implementation of best management practices, has so far been accomplished through voluntary and incentive-based programs. Next, please. There is also a market-based approach. It works effectively when tight regulations make implementation of additional upgrades extremely costly for utilities, and they are willing to invest outside the fence 
into non-point source reductions that they can take credit for. In 2018, current and the University of Chicago Law School gathered experts to assess the feasibility of phosphorus trading program in Illinois. The participants' consensus was that the regulatory conditions were not yet in place to implement such a program. However, other issues came to the forefront, such as lack of confidence in the effectiveness of best management practices, which is largely a scientific and technological issue. Current went on to identify technologies that can address it. And of course, nutrient sensors and analyzers were on top of the list, because to use the words of the well-known American management consultant, Peter Drucker, you can't manage what you can't measure. Next, please. When you listen to our presenters today, you may hear the following terms. Accuracy, very important because we want to know how closely sensor estimates reflect the actual nutrient concentrations. Precision, how close are sensor readings one to another? Lack of precision introduces greater uncertainty. Sensitivity, how much do the actual concentrations need to change to produce a response in the sensor output? Limits of detection or range of detection are also important, especially for remote monitoring applications. Next, please. Analytical methods are broadly divided into wet chemistry and instrumental methods. Wet chemistry is also called classical chemistry, and it uses techniques that my favorite character, Sherlock Holmes, would have used in his lab. In reality, most of the test, uh, tests are nowadays performed by a combination of wet chemistry and instrumental methods. Modern wet chemistry methods are highly selective for particular chemical species and are also very accurate. Uh, for phosphorus and some forms of nitrogen, they're actually the only methods currently available. Adapting them to remote monitoring applications is not an easy task, but as we will see today, not impossible. Um, with advances in optical and electrochemical sensor technologies, we now also have purely instrumental methods for nitrate and nitride monitoring. In the end, the method of choice and the approach depends on the monitoring needs and the system being monitored. Next, please. The main benefit of remote monitoring technologies, which we'll hear about today, is the ability to test on demand and have visibility, often in real time, into how water quality changes as the event, events happen. Uh, cost savings come mainly from eliminating the need to physically collect and transport samples and automating the analysis process. There are also fewer or no, no chemical use. Next, please. However, there are also challenges. Uh, some are caused by fluctuating conditions which may interfere with the testing method or cause equipment fouling. The accuracy of results is more difficult to assess. And there may be interruptions in data flow due to insufficient power supply, connectivity loss, or exposure to vandalism. And our presenters today will talk about how they guard against some of those challenges. Thank you for your attention. I hope this introduction was helpful and I look forward to hearing from our guests. Elena? So much, Elena. That was terrific. And I hope you can all see why we are so <laughs> focused on tackling this issue and so excited about the experts we've got here today to talk about their solutions. So coming to us from Cincinnati, Ohio, I'm really excited to introduce Brent Register, who's the Midwest Territory Manager for OTT Hydromet. Brent, over to you. Thanks, Elena. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Appreciate you donating some time here to learn about this particular topic here today. And as Elena mentioned, I am the Territory Manager for Odd Hydromet. Uh, and I am going to feature a sensor that actually has a different name on it, as you can see uh, on the label there. So this is actually a Seabird Coastal, uh, or a Seabird Scientific, uh, better known as, uh, instrument. Um, Odd Hydromet, uh, a little background on that. We're actually a conglomerate of different companies. Uh, so we're, uh, we, we actually have three different brands inside of Odd Hydromet, Odd being the German company that manufactures uh, weather sensors and pressure sensors for water level. Uh, Hydrolab, which is an American-based uh, water quality SON manufacturer. Uh, and Sutron, which is the data logging and also surface water level sensing 
company based in, in Virginia. Um, we are actually a part of a larger conglomerate called Danaher Corporation, which owns Seabird Scientific. Uh, and Seabird Scientific is pretty well known across the, uh, across the world for uh, their oceanographic sensors and their blue water sensors. Uh, however, since they created the SUNA V2 nitrate sensor along with the hydrocycle PO4 uh, orthophosphate analyzer, uh, they focused some of their uh, attention to freshwater nutrient monitoring. So in partnership, we are at Audit Hydromet uh, and, and myself in the Midwest Territory uh, and their sales force and, and their, their uh, speaker for their products uh, to the freshwater nutrient uh, monitoring uh, network. So uh, with that, uh, we can kind of skip ahead to the next slide if you don't mind, George. So the SUNO was actually designed specifically uh, for the in situ freshwater and coastal markets. Uh, and in fact, the first version was created in 2008. So the original version is actually uh, a little bit older. Uh, but after we released that and gathered numerous feedbacks from all of the deployments from the customers, uh, we were able to make some improvements and then released uh, the SUNO V2, which has been on the market uh, since 2013. Uh, so with that, the original design uh, underwent some changes, uh, and some of those changes include uh, adaptive sampling. Uh, so this, the SUNA is actually a smart instrument uh, where it knows how to increase the amount of light or lamp time uh, to give it a good value or a proper reading and those really difficult uh, optically challenging waters uh, that we can encounter in the Midwest especially. So those with high CDOM rates uh, and those that are very, very turbid. Um, we're also able to sort in the path length uh, for better performance in those higher turbid waters and also feature that uh, a, a anti-fouling integrated wiper to keep those pathways cleaner for longer. So it allows the end user to deploy these instruments uh, year round uh, without having to visit them very often. Um, another another uh, feature of the version two uh, that we've improved on is custom calibration. So as mentioned, this, this sensor can actually be deployed uh, in freshwater and in saltwater, and we can calibrate for both. Um, so we can feature a freshwater calibration for high nitrate, uh, a freshwater calibration with no bromide correction, and a saltwater calibration that includes freshwater and bromide coefficients. Uh, so that was something that we added back in 2013. Uh, additionally, uh, we have absorption outputs. Um, the SUNA will now provide, uh, does now provide values at 254 and 350 nanometers, uh, which is the traditional wavelengths that CDOM coordinates, uh, coordinates with absorption. Uh, and these can, uh, as a result, these can be used as a proxy for, for those types of CDOM measurements. Um, the unit actually also uh, was incorporated to have internal memory and a USB connection for just basic ease of use. Uh, and it also features a titanium housing. Uh, or the original version had more of a composite type material. Uh, so the titanium housing certainly gives it more durability over the long term. Uh, next slide, George, please. So the principles of operation and basically what does this instrument do? So the SUNA is a spectrophotometer. Uh, so for those who do not know what a spectrometer does, it measures the property of lights over a specific portion of the spectrum. Uh, the variable light uh, is the, the, the variable measured is the light intensity. Uh, so in a sense, uh, in the sense of the SUNA, a lamp emits a UV light which is then transmitted uh, through the fixed sample volume. On the other side, there's a UV spectrometer or detector uh, for layman's terms that measures the amount of that UV light that has traveled through the sample area. Uh, so in short, the SUNA works by examining the absorption of the emitted UV light by dissolved nitrate. Uh, additionally, the SUNA uses a specialized algorithm that's developed to calculate the concentration of nitrate based on the absorbance of light between 220 and 240 nanometers. So why does that SUNA measure the specific wave, this specific wavelength range? So to make that a, a, an easier um, concept to, to take in, 
nitrate has a very strong measurement curve in the low UV light spectrum. And this nitrate curve is unlike any other chemical species observed in this range, and that there are not, no overlap directly with the nitrate. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please, George? So some deployment considerations, and there's a couple pictures here uh, highlighting, you know, a, a typical type of setup. Um, you know, we have, we have these kind of around the Midwest and various platforms. Some might be on a buoy uh, or some sort of floating platform. Some might be in a fixed caged, as you can see in the picture off to the right. Uh, and some can even just be deployed, you know, on a boat as it's moving with a flow cell. Um, so we adopted, or the SUNA was created to uh, adhere to meeting a lot of the, uh, the challenging environments that uh, researchers and technicians encounter, uh, especially in the Midwest where you have very productive waters with high uh, biofouling tendencies. Um, you know, we combat that with a copper guard that actually covers the, the sample pathway uh, and then we also have that wiper that's able to go inside uh, and clean that window and keep that pathway clear uh, and prevent fouling from happening. So even though we're able to kind of put uh, the SUNA in, in um, uh, applications like you're seeing on the screen, uh, we'll also have some internal mechanisms that can help keep it clean and keep it shielded from the environment. Um, so the SUNA can not only be deployed in those types of mooring applications as we're looking at now for long-term deployments, uh, but we can also use them in profiling applications as well. Um, the SUNA is actually capable of sampling at one hertz, uh, which is actually one sample per second. Um, and it's also used for depth and cross-sectional profiles as well. And many users, uh, as I mentioned, will, they'll use the SUNA for point sampling, uh, but most, most of the deployments are fully submerged. Um, but as mentioned, and as, as depicted in the lower left, that, that uh, um, pole there with a flow cell on it uh, is actually a add-on that we can uh, include with the SUNA to allow those remotely pumped applications as well as benchtop applications if, if that were to be the case. Um, with all of these types of applications, though, the SUNA will need a power source. So for long-term deployments, these, uh, these deployments will be connected to some sort of data logging uh, platform, most commonly. Um, if it's not and it's a standalone, we do have an internal battery pack that will actually keep uh, battery power to the SUNA. Um, it would just add a little bit extra bulk uh, to the application. Uh, but as far as mounting, um, the SUNA really could be mounted, uh, is really meant to be mounted horizontally, uh, but it can be mounted vertically as well. Next slide, please. So we have many, many different applications, uh, and we have many examples of the applications uh, and many different users uh, of, of the SUNA uh, in the Midwest specifically. Uh, we have the USGS that uses this instrument. Um, they have the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the state and uh, state DNRs are also involved and, and might use these from time to time. Uh, but I've, I've highlighted a couple of our more in-depth studies here. Um, these happen to be uh, one of the, the project in, in the picture is actually from Florida. Um, and one of our uh, product managers uh, and lead scientists uh, actually tested uh, this SUNA and in addition our cycle uh, PO4 orthophosphate analyzer here in, uh, in this example in Florida. Uh, we, Florida has a massive nutrient problem much like our, our Mississippi River Basin, uh, you know, highly eutrophic waters uh, and we've done extensive research with the SUNA and the cycle uh, PO4 sensor in these really adverse, uh, very eutrophic systems and have had great luck over long-term uh, deployments. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, I mean, really that's, that's I don't want to take up too much time. I think we were kind of limited originally to five minutes. Um, so I kind of made this fairly short and, and I'm sure I'm probably at the five minute point now, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any further questions at the end of the, uh, at the in, end of the program here. Great. Actually, we'll take questions now. We've been kind of integrating them in the Q&A. So and we've got a few. So okay. uh, I think first there's a question about 
how you get the data from the sensor collected and displayed remotely. So specifically, what are the kinds of communication protocols that are supported? You talked about sort of the battery power and how yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, so this, the SUNA actually can output an RS-232 or a serial output. Um, it, if it's connected to a data logger, um, it's probably easiest controlled by a SDI-12, um, so, uh, which is a digital interface. Um, and then also the SUNA, if you do not have access to a data logger, the SUNA does have onboard memory. So uh, the SUNA can log uh, the data internally, which is a two gig uh, memory bank, and then you can transfer that using a USB communications cable to a PC. Um, so there's ways to do it standalone. There's also ways to integrate it into really any manufacturer's uh, data logger that can take in an SDI-12 or an RS-232 uh, sensor. Great. And then follow up to that. So have you done an automated cross-section or variable depth profile install? So we'd be actually collecting data from a cross-section without a human? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, yeah, those are uh, pretty common, actually. Um, in fact, on the Illinois, uh, well, not on the Illinois River, on the um, uh, Mississippi River Basin, uh, actually outside of St. Louis, um, there's a particular community college that has deployed a number of different um, floating platforms, and they've incorporated a number of different sensors. Um, now, these are stationary, um, but they do they, they are moored out in the Mississippi River, uh, but they've been out there collecting data over the last uh, about seven years. Now they don't move them across the cross section, uh, mm -hmm. don't vertically profile them specifically. Uh, but as I mentioned, with the one hertz sampling frequency, it would allow uh, any user to connect it to a profiler, uh, whether that's manually controlled or automated uh, and collect one, sam one second data uh, so that, that is a, a, a capability of the SUNA. Great. Well, thanks so much. For, this was a terrific presentation, and I'm excited to follow up on all of those uh, different threads. So, oh, great. Contact yep. Fin yep, finally the contact information there at the end. Excellent. Really appreciate that. And, of course, as always with our innovative showcases, these are recorded and available on our events page, so everybody can go there to find this later. Great, so next up, I'm very happy to be introducing uh, Dr. Owen Murray, who's the R&D manager for Tell Lab. Owen, over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Cheers. Um, so yeah, this talk introduces a new portable and deployable um, in-situ analyzer for the monitoring of nitrate and nitrite in both industrial and envir environmental waters called Aquamonitrix. Next slide. So the Aquamonitrix device um, sets out to address the need for cost-effective nitrate and nitrite monitoring. Um, the analyzer can provide, um, enables real-time pollution information through the generation of near real-time um, concentration data. Uh, the analyzer also facilitates or um, allows for a reduction or elimination in fines relating to pollution incidents for effluent licensees. Um, the analyzer is also very simple, so it doesn't require skilled engineers for deployment or servicing, um, and, and the analyzer is also low cost. Um, so it's, it's, there's a low cost of ownership associated with the, with the analyzer also. Next slide. So the technology itself then, the analyzer incorporates or, or uses um, a new uh, patented technology which incorporates um, a new 235 nanometer deep UV LED um, in combination with a rapid ion chromatography technique for the selective detection of, of nitrite and nitrate um, in under three minutes. And, and, and the analyzer can be applied to a whole range of, of various water types, ranging from surface waters all the way to, to very highly polluted wastewaters. Next slide. So the Aquamonitrix nitrate nitrite analyzer then um, will be, it'll be commercially launched and commercially available from December of this year, 2020. And as you can see from the design of the system, um, I don't know, I don't think you can see my mouse here, but essentially there's various compartments within, within the unit. Uh, Eluent storage is housed within the, within the component with the, the compartment on the left. The fluidic components then are housed on the right of the container with waste storage um, at the bottom of the unit. 
the system then of course is is portable but the outer the design of the outer casing of the unit allows for various different types of mounting depending on on, on the application so it's it's a very versatile system in terms of your deployment need and, and the type of deployment application next slide in terms of results then and the analytical performance of the system uh, here, are, here are results generated by the US EPA over a one month deployment of the Aquamonitrix device. Uh, it was an in-field deployment analyzing septic tank water. Um, so challenging environment. Um, mm. The concentrations generated by the Aquamonitrix device are shown here in blue. So the left graph is for nitrate, the right graph is for nitrite. Um, the Grab sample concentrations, which were generated by the US EPA using accredited lab based instrumentation, are shown uh, by the red points there. So, as you can see, high levels of accuracy and precision were generated by the Aquamonitrix device over the course of the one month deployment um, at that sampling frequency of every hour. Um, despite the fact that it was deployed in, in the field, a very challenging environment and a very challenging matrix of, of, of septic tank water. So the system is, is, is very versatile as well. So um, purely by selecting a larger sample loop volume, so uh, for example, a 150 microliter sample loop volume, the analyzer can achieve high levels of sensitivity. So very low uh, PPV limits of detection applicable to surface water analysis. Um, and if you take a sample loop volume, a, a small sample loop volume of say 10 microliters, the analyzer can be used to analyze highly polluted waters such as wastewater, effluent water and in fact septic tank water as well. So in terms of the analytical range for the for the analyzer there's a very broad range and, and, and the system is, is, is very versatile in that regard. Next slide. To give you some more examples of, of, of the deployments then so the graph on the left shows a deployment of the Aquamonitrix device in a wastewater treatment facility in Finland over a two month period and deployed in situ. Uh, it was a recent deployment. Again, you can see the concentrations generated, the nitrate concentrations generated by the Aquamonitrix device shown in black and the graph sample concentrations, which again were generated by accredited lab-based instrumentation by the, the wastewater treatment facility, they're shown in orange. So again, you can see the correlation and, and the high levels of accuracy uh, achieved by the analyzer. Similarly, then on the graph on the right, you can see a deployment of the Aquamonitrix device um, for the analysis of surface water, river water in this case, and this was downstream of an agricultural landscape. Um, so again, the Aquamonitrix concentrations for nitrate are shown in black with the graph sample concentrations shown in orange. Again, you can see that the level, the, the correlation between the graph and the Aquamonitrix concentrations. As of right now, there are 27 Aquamonitrix units deployed around the world, currently being tested in wastewater treatment facilities and also in various surface water applications as well. And the analytical performance of the, of the Aquamonitrix um, has been shown to be comparable to that which was achieved during the US, um, US deployment for the septic tank analysis um, in which the US EPA what we're involved in and it was carried out with the US EPA. Next slide, please. So for our target customers then, um, for the Aquamonitrix unit, water utilities, environmental agencies, um, trade effluent licensees, uh, agricultural applications, and also aquaculture applications as well. So they're our target customers. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the Aquamonitrix nitrate and nitrite analyzer will be commercially available from December of this year, 2020. In terms of pre-booking, pre pricing and, and delivery details, uh, please contact our sales team regarding those, those, those um, subjects. Be sure to, for more information then, be sure to visit our website um, and also be sure to register your interest on the, the Aquamonitrix website at uh, aquamonitrix.com. So that's my talk. Um, I'm, thanks for listening and I'm very, uh, I welcome any questions now at this stage. Dr. Murray, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We do have uh, a few questions here. First one, can this device collect flow proportion samples? Flow proportion samples in, 
Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? Hmm. David, I don't know if you want to unmute. If you're able to, let's see. And elaborate. This is David. Yeah, let, let me, if I can, just say what I mean by that. I mean, in most or many monitoring requirements in, in, in uh, discharge permits in the U.S. required flow proportion composite sampling. So for every unit of flow, a, a unit of sample is collected. And um, I was just wondering, is there an interface on, on this device that would allow you to couple it with a flow meter and rather than every X hours, uh, collect the sample and do the analysis every X units of flow? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, absolutely. That that would be possible. Integration of a flow meter is would be very straightforward. Currently, the system how the sample intake uh, operates is there's an outermost sample intake, and um, essentially it's um, a twelve volt pump that um, draws sample at a fairly high flow rate, just to make sure it, it fills a, a small reservoir, um, just to ensure that a homogeneous sample is is drawn. Then an aliquot from that reservoir is, is is taken into the system for analysis, and um, so adding a flow meter to, to to that would be would be straightforward. Yeah. And then just last question uh, from Elena: um, of the twenty seven units installed, what's the split between wastewater treatment plants and rivers slash streams? Yeah, the, the majority are wastewater treatment facilities. So the the, the expectation is for for version one, which will be um, launched. In December, uh, that would be primarily wastewater treatment facilities um, connected to power and, and, and so on. Further versions then down the line would be um, more, more targeting the surface water applications, uh, purely purely battery powered and, 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 and so forth. So at the moment, it's um, the majority, probably 70% of those deployments right now are wastewater treatment facilities. Got it. And just if I can ask a follow up question to that. Um, is there a size or sort of scale of wastewater treatment plant that you think is going to make the most sense as a target customer or is that you can scale this up or down? Yeah, well, in, in, in terms of, um, in terms of the, 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 it's a simple system to manufacture. So, I mean, in terms of price points as well, it, it, it's possible to have multiple systems within, within um, one facility, depending on the size. Um, if that answers your question. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary, for the presentation. Um, so we're going to go into our next uh, presenter, which is Dr. Luca, project manager and marketing manager for Sestea. Hello. Do you hear me? Perfectly. Good. So thank you for everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Luca Sanfilippo. Uh, may I have my slide, please? So our company is uh, as 30 years uh, old and uh, the goal is to uh, develop, manufacture and sell in the international market uh, analyzers to measure chemical parameters in water. Next, you click and there is the open the, okay, next. And uh, no, wait, okay. Um, uh, our uh, micro LFR technology uh, was developed uh, in 2008. Uh, the goal uh, of uh, the probe that I'm going to introduce you is uh, to measure uh, nutrients in surface and coastal water. That usually is a very difficult task because uh, there is, was already explained, uh, the sample has to be taken from, la, uh, from the site and then brought in lab and then measured by a laboratory method. Next. Uh, I we realize that now there is okay. That's okay. So the best solution is uh, uh, to work on field because you avoid the uh, inaccuracies from transport and sampling. Uh, next. Uh, we worked for more than two decades. Uh, no, wait a moment, please. Thank you. Uh, we are working from two decades uh, to develop uh, some type of nutrients analysis in water. Uh, from the starting point of the, of, the, of the company, 
we developed a compact uh, system, uh, more or less similar in concept uh, from the previous one that was showed. And um, this analyzer, based on a particular reactor, uh, was launched in 2009. To measure first nutrients, and then we improved the other parameters, as you see. Next slide. Next, okay. So, uh, next. The main um, concept of uh, this analyzer is uh, an in situ probe, so is the automation of lab analysis brought on field. It has a multiparametric capability and can measure up to four parameters in one unit uh, measured sequentially, one after the other one. The main application of this analyzer is for surface, uh, ground and sea water monitoring. It has a quite a good low detection limit. Uh, it's protea sensibility, but effectively the low detection limit is around five uh, micrograms per liter. Nitrate is less, uh, nitrate mm. is a bit more. A low maintenance and suitable for medium and long term deployments. The uh, technology is, uh, is a wet chemistry. Uh, next. And the next, uh, the wet chemistry um, methods that are applied uh, with spectrophotometric and for uh, ammonia, even fluorimetric methods. So we have a unit that can measure the four nutrients in one unit, and even a unit that uh, can measure total phosphorus, night, and uh, total uh, and uh, orthophosphate. Another one that can measure total nitrogen and also nitrate and nitrite, and even a, a unit that can combine total phosphorus and total nitrogen together. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, this is a uh, first deployment uh, picture of uh, taken in 2009, and uh, where we installed this analyzer on this platform in Venice Lagoon. And this is the trend of nutrients that we achieved uh, along uh, 20 days of deployment. As you see, the measurements were done every two hours, and uh, we can really have a powerful trend and dynamic, uh, we, we catch the, the trends and dynamic uh, of nutrients uh, that uh, were influenced also by a river intake uh, on the uh, lagoon of Venice, that is a shallow lagoon, mm -hmm. and that is affected, highly uh, affected also by tide effect. Uh, next slide. Here I will show some uh, installations. Uh, this uh, is the first installation on the left we had in China for uh, total nitrogen. And uh, uh, the, the, the here after also we integrated uh, a total phosphorus uh, probe in Zuai Lake that is a reservoir near Macau. On the right top, uh, we have an installation on a shallow river in uh, Austrian mountains, uh, done by University of Salzburg. And uh, for the first time, they asked us also to measure total organic P, not only total phosphorus. That means the organic part of total phosphorus. And the third one on the bottom right side is an installation in Taihu Lake in 2011. That is a very polluted lake that is also used as a reservoir that is not far from Shanghai. Next one. Uh, this is uh, the picture of the analyzer uh, uh, ready to be placed uh, in uh, the installation in uh, uh, Austria. Next. Uh, we participated in the Nutrient Sensor Challenge that uh, uh, was a challenge organized by Alliance of Cost and Technologies, uh, where there were three types of deployments. One uh, on a quite polluted river affected by quite high dyna dynamic of nitrate and even phosphate in Ohio, is Maumee River. And uh, you see uh, these are the two analyzers uh, we proposed, one for nitrate, one for phosphate. And, and they were installed uh, on this uh, pool that was fed regularly by the, the river water. And you see the river water is very dirty. Mm -hmm. But the analyzers uh, uh, catched uh, for the full month uh, the uh, measurements uh, continuously. Uh, next. 
This is a second deployment in a cheese peak that is in Maryland, that is an estuary uh, where uh, EPA is used to perform a lot of measurements for uh, water quality. There is also an important lab in US, uh, it's very famous. Next. And um, uh, this is the installation, next. And uh, this is the trend of nutrients we catched in this deployment uh, only for phosphate. And uh, in this, in the same site, there was performed also an extensive uh, lab validation of the sensors uh, using uh, standards, using different type of standards and took uh, quite a long time. Next one, please. And uh, finally, there was a third, uh, a third field deployment for another month in Hawaii. Uh, where uh, was uh, practically oligotrophic water, so very clean water. In fact, as you see, the trends are practically zero. And uh, finally, uh, in the ASLO conference in Hawaii, uh, there was the award of this uh, Nutrient Sensor Challenge, where we participa participated together with other five manufacturers. And uh, <laughs> surprisingly, we won uh, both for the both awards, both for nitrate and both for phosphate. Next. Starting for this, uh, from these searches in US, uh, next one. We started to have uh, deployments for EPA in North America. This is a deployment of uh, two wheat probes, uh, one for nitrate and one for phosphate uh, in a lake reservoir in 2017. And the second one on the right is another uh, installation or even held by EPA in Mary Mac River in Massachusetts. Um, next one. This is a very interesting deployment. We followed between 2018 and 2019 in Canada, uh, where uh, uh, the University of Windsor deployed four props. Uh, in a lake and even on a river. The next one, probably there is also the picture on the river. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, showing the flexibility of the analyzer that uh, can be deployed in a small coastal lake buoy uh, integrated by photovoltaic panels and uh, uh, batteries and data logger to send the data on the web. Uh, even the nutrient sensor challenge uh, follow this type of rule that means that uh, the analyzers were deployed uh, and the self-autonomous sensors, uh, including photovoltaic panels, batteries, and uh, data logger. Next one. Uh, next, okay, you can complete the next, okay. Uh, now we have uh, in uh, around 10 years uh, of work, before maybe 12, because we had also another type of probe uh, named the NPA before. Now we have uh, plus 400 uh, installations uh, in uh, different uh, countries, mainly in China, where the problem of nutrients uh, sensors is very, uh, very sensitive. Uh, our main customers are environmental protection agencies uh, and universities, universities and research institutes for environmental control. Next one. And I think is finished my presentation. And uh, if you like to have information, you can have a look on our website and uh, or even to write us at our email address. Thank you for your uh, attention. Great, thank you so much, Luca. That was terrific. We do have a question specifically about the range of deployment scenarios you showed there and all the different yes. conditions, right? So the question is, can the probe be used outdoors when you regularly have below freezing temperatures or do you need to actually have it housed inside something that has heating? No, the probe is designed to be directly deployed in water. For the nutrient sensor challenge was uh, uh, the uh, decision of the organizers to place the instruments in the first deployment in that pool that I showed you. But as you see in the second and even the third site, the probes were directly deployed in water. That is their main use. In fact, 
most of our probes are installed in buoys, in coastal buoys on lake buoys, directly put in water. Great. All right, any final questions? We had a clarification on the chat. CDOM, Colored Dissolved Organic Matter from earlier in the presentation, a, a great acronym to learn. Um, and so many different technologies that we've seen here uh, today. So keep these conversations going. Um, definitely reach out to any of these presenters. Oh, one, one final question, we'll come back. Um, how often do consumable chemicals need to be replaced? Great question. Uh, it depends mainly on the frequency of measurement. Now we uh, have designed our probes uh, to be deployed on site uh, for at least one month unattended, uh, having a measurement frequency of at least uh, two hours. Mm. That means uh, you can get 12 measurements for four parameters for one month. That is quite a long time. Uh, usually in a lake, uh, it is not uh, so important to have so much high frequency because even uh, uh, usually when you do monitoring in the normal sense, uh, you grab a sample, break, bring it in lab, uh, and then you can do it every week or maybe ever every month. Of course, in a river, the measurement frequency is important. But in any case, uh, uh, the deployment for one month or even two months, uh, this is possible. Mm -hmm. And how about, we have a question in the chat for calibration. Um, how often does calibration need to happen? For our analyzers, they have built-in standards and it mainly depends on the method. There are some methods which are much more stable. So that means that even if you do a control check of the standard, but without recalibrating, you can have a shift in one month that could be not more than 10%. So we suggest, for example, for phosphate not, not to calibrate, only to do a control check every day or every two days. For nitrate, it's better to calibrate every day. So there is a, a standard inside that uh, can is uh, automatically injected uh, um, uh, instead of a sample. And uh, in case there is uh, a variation that is more than a certain percentage, the automatically, there is the automatic uh, calibration so of the optical density. Mm -hmm. And then I, this is a question I think for everybody with probe technology. Um, are, is your probe housing able to accommodate other types of sensors if people are interested in measuring you know, other things other than the nitrogen and phosphorus? Are you able to, is your housing able to add more sensors on? This is something we've been- The design of our probe is mainly to be a standalone system that can be coupled with other sensors in an integrated water quality monitoring system. That mm -hmm. means that you can have a buoy that can couple the width yeah. probe with a multi-parametric probe for, from uh, different manufacturers or uh, another type of system. Uh, uh, our probe uh, is uh, connected to the external world by RS-232, the so sign, so, some, something similar to what already described by my colleague of, uh, of SUNA, of, uh, of the OT technology. And uh, usually there is a data logger that collects the data from different sensors together and then send the data to the remote by web, uh, to the web usually now. Great. Thanks. We can provide a built-in data logger, external small data log that also we used for the neutral sensor challenge that can combine together even a multi-parametric probe. So you can have a very small, uh, uh, but it ingr integrated the standalone system that consists of the weeds probe and the multi-parametric probe. That Great. could have a big effective uh, for nutrient and monitoring. Perfect, thank you. Well, we are right. out of time and I wanna thank all of our presenters, Brent, Owen, Luca, thank you so much for sharing and, and especially thank you so much for building these technologies and businesses that will really help address this truly global challenge. I hope everyone got a sense today that this is something that is not only a backyard issue for us here in Chicago and in Illinois, though of course it is, um, but it was really one of the range of, of deployments and, and applications here. So as we all kind of move forward and tackle this together. Um, just a couple of announcements as we close up. Again, 
please register for many of the events for Chicago's first Water Week, September 28th through October 2nd. I hope we'll see many of you there and spread the word. And again, if you or your company are interested in sponsoring or partnering as a program participant, please reach out, let us know, uh, and we hope to see all of you there. And as always, uh, you'll be able to find this event and all of our previous Innovator Showcases recorded and archived on Current's event page. So visit us at currentwater.org. Uh, reach out to me, reach out to Evan if you'd like to hear more about any of Chicago Next upcoming programs. Uh, and we just will look forward to seeing you on the next ed edition of the Innovator Showcase Series. So thank you so much, everyone.